Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this Advancing Equity and Online Learning at Community Colleges webinar, uh, co-hosted by the Michelson 20MM Foundation, as well as ISKME. Uh, it looks like we have a steady stream of people still trickling in, so we're going to give it another minute or two, and then we will go ahead and get started. Hello to everyone who's just joined us. Thank you for coming to the Advancing Equity and Online Learning at Community Colleges webinar, co-hosted by the Michelson 20MM Foundation, as well as our partners at ISKME. Um, this is a webinar, uh, so you should only be seeing both the uh, deck that is to share, the screen is being shared, um, as well as the panelists. Um, there, I, I think I saw a question in the chat around uh, video for participants and audio. Um, that, that would be turned off. If you do have questions throughout the webinar, we encourage you to put them in the Q&A feature. Um, and there'll be uh, some time at the end of the presentation um, to review the questions. But first, what I'd like to do is introduce uh, to y'all, uh, the esteemed panel who will be speaking to us today. So if you could advance to the next slide. So a quick introduction to myself, and then I'll um, let uh, everyone else say hello. My name is Ryan Erickson Kulas. I'm a program officer at the Michelson 20MM Foundation. Also on the call, we have Amy Evans Godwin, who is the VP of Research and Development for ISKME. Hello. We have Cynthia Himes, who's the Director of Research and Learning at ISKME. Hi, everyone. Amanda Tainter, who's the Faculty Coordinator, Instructional Design and Distance Education, and Interim Director of Title V at Reedley College. Hi, everybody as well as James Glapper-Grossglag, the Dean of Educational Technology, Learning Resources, and Distance Learning at College of the Canyons. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. So I wanted to, to very quickly frame the conversation um, that we're having today um, and give a little bit of information about the Michelson 20MM Foundation. We as a foundation got our start a little over 10 years ago in the space of OER um, with a $1.5 million grant to OpenStax. Um, since then, we've uh, really grown as an organization, expanding our reach to other areas of student access and success within higher education. But of course, our roots are always within um, the open education movement. Uh, in early 2019, we launched our Spark Grant program which was designed to be a rapid response fund um, to address needs that would go unmet via a traditional grant making process. We had a COVID specific cycle in the spring of last year when COVID came on. Um, and really what we look to do is support uh, faculty, students and schools as they were transitioning to a remote education environment. Uh, ISKME was one of those uh, awardees from that cycle. And so today we'll be discussing the second uh, document that was created, or excuse me, resource that was created um, through that partnership, which is um, a guide for administrators as they are looking to support faculty who want to utilize or transition to open educational resources um, during this time of remote instruction. And so with that, I'll pass it over uh, to Amy. Thank you, Ryan. Okay, I will also set the stage a little bit for where we are today and what has brought us here um, around the notion of open educational resources. Um, just starting with the uh, who we are, ISKME is an education nonprofit based in Half Moon Bay, California. 
And we're focused on making teaching and learning more open and participatory and equitable. We, we study and support knowledge sharing. And the guide and the discussion today is very much focused on that. Where can we help make professional learning tools, support practice, and changes, uh, as, in this case, at the community college level? We also have developed over the last 15 years the OER Commons, a public digital library of OER. Now, not everyone may know what OER is. Even though we've been doing this work for almost 20 years, uh, there's still um, a new awareness that really needs to be built around this. The, these are teaching and learning materials that are either in the public domain or carry an open license and a set of permissions and responsibilities that allow anyone to use them and reuse them and adapt them without having to uh, ask special permission or uh, without any cost. So that's just uh, the, the basis of where this work is. And uh, our, our um, position is to advocate for OER and to create more resources that facilitate and accelerate where OER can really make a difference. Now, we have been uh, all experiencing an uncommon year. Uh, we're in a state of crisis for uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and in California with wildfire, wildfire evacuations that happened before and during this year, and we anticipate future crises. Taken all together, there has really been an urgent and growing need to have digital course materials, these open materials, try to fill the gaps that have been left by publishers and publishers' textbooks where they often had not made the digital versions available. Uh, and really left students out in the cold. The libraries have been closed. The bookstores had delays. There were already barriers for cost for students to purchase uh, their textbooks. And if they could not get them through course reserves through the library, they were often forced to purchase access codes and codes are temporary. So really, this was um, quite um, an emergency uh, with COVID for uh, changes in access and for colleges to respond to this. In addition, additionally, as the, the crisis continues, colleges are facing budget deficits and uh, real challenges to keep students enrolling, um, completing courses and succeeding over time. And, and with the face of um, continued disruptions, uh, we really see an urgent need for more policy supports, procedures locally, and changes to practice that can keep students coming back. So there is uh, some light at the end of this dark tunnel. Uh, and we're hoping that open education can be part of the solution. The opportunity here is that OER uh, is always available. It's legally available and technically available for students to be able to access materials and for faculty to more effectively and flexibly integrate open resources into their own courses, into their course management systems, which is um, often Canvas in the California system. And with the ability to be able to freely adapt OER, these changes in instruction and making materials more engaging and culturally responsive and relevant is where we see a lot of the change that could happen. Uh, I'll pass it to Cynthia to talk a bit about the research and uh, our outcome of the project. Yes, yeah, so thanks, Amy. So if we look at the evidence that speak to some of the arguments Amy made, um, and we look back over the past decade or so, the early research around OER was really focused on the student cost savings that OER brought. 
Um, in the past five or so years, we're really seeing a body of evidence grow around the benefits and impact on teaching and learning and even on institutional costs. So there have been several studies, I just listed three here, that show that OER really does impact enrollment in courses. It decreases um, rates of receiving DFs or withdrawal for students and for Pell Grant recipients most extensively if we look at the University of Georgia study. Um, and also at Tidewater, researchers there were able to show that OER decreased student drop rates while also increasing institutional revenue from retained tuition. So there's a really pretty significant body of research that's pinpointing the benefits of OER for teaching and learning and for student success. So as, as we know, the purpose of this webinar is to really highlight the ways that campus leaders can support the use of OER on their campuses and specifically for online learning. And so with the funding that we received through the Michelson 20MM Spark Grant, we collaborated with five colleges in California who were really making that successful transition of using OER for online learning. And the colleges included West Hills College Lemoore, Butte College, Fresno City College, and then Reed Lee and College of the Canyons, which are represented on the panel today. And the purpose of the guidebook is to really zoom in on concrete practical supports that campus leaders can provide in encouraging OER use for online learning. And I just wanted to show you quickly, I'm going to share my screen now, Amy. Um, Got it. Great. So the guide is available as a Google Doc that anyone can take and adapt their, to their local context, as well as a PDF. Um, we'll give you the link to the guide as part of the, the slides, but um, the guide really does center in first and foremost on building that argument for the why of OER for online learning. And then it zooms in on the, the meat of the work, um, which is the practices and supports that campuses that are doing this successively have found to be necessary to enable OER for online learning. So there's a readiness checklist that campus leaders can use. There's a list of faculty supports that have found to be successful in this transition. Um, and then finally, we move into the policy and process related supports. For example, we show some ways that campus leaders can encourage the development of OER resolutions from the academic senate, from the board, um, from even from student government. And we provide example resolution language that other colleges have used to encourage the use of OER. And then finally, we move into state policy at the California level, but we also give tools like the OER policy tracker that you can use to track OER policy in your state, as well as some other resources to help you in developing and influencing OER policy in your state and at your campus. So now I'll turn it over back to Amy, who's going to facilitate a discussion with our panelists from two of the colleges that were key in helping us develop this guide. So I'll stop share. Oh, sorry. There we go. I just want to get my video back. <laughs> Good. 
There we go. And Amanda, you can join us. Um, and we'll be talking to Amanda and James now. Um, California has had um, quite a concerted effort around OER over time. And yet that has varied from campus to campus is what we found out. It's very dependent upon um, local supports and OER champions and committees and the way uh, uh, faculty are engaged. I'd love to hear from you, Amanda, uh, about Reedley College and particularly in the ye last year where there must have been many shifts uh, to online learning in light of the pandemic and um, how OER has been part of that. Okay, so I just want to start with what we did when everything first hit and, and how we um, embraced the transition and training of faculty. So I get to be in this really neat dual role where I'm both the DE coordinator and the instructional designer on our campus. And what our college or what our district had decided to do is we were going to pause instruction for four days to be able to roll out um, trainings to get faculty as prepared as possible um, to this, this new world that, that we were um, finding ourselves in. And so the weekend before before we were gonna have the four days. So the weekend before I sat down and and I thought about the lessons I had learned as a trainer of, of, of faculty and especially what I had learned in being an OER advocate on campus. And, and one of the big takeaways I had um, from my work in encouraging OER use is that as more faculty began to adopt OER, I realized there was faculty using OER that, that I hadn't even talk to. And it was because of fellow faculty trainers that were getting the word out. And so as I thought about how in the world am I going to train and support hundreds of faculty to get ready to teach fully online, it was the realization that, it, that it's not about all about me, that I've got at, at my fingertips, so to speak, this world of amazing faculty who are online teaching veterans, um, and that I can leverage their, their brains and, and their knowledge to help me train the faculty. So sat down the weekend before we were going to go online and um, I made a grid and decided all right we're going to spend these five days Monday through Friday that we had 8 a.m to 8 p.m and offer as many trainings as we could um, and so that's what I did about three trainings every hour 8 a.m to 8 p.m Monday through Friday tapped all these trainers on the shoulders they signed up for times um, I created a resource that would help standardize and say here are the topics that would be great if you covered in your trainings here are the links that you'll need for the trainings just to have at their fingertips and here are some tips and tricks um, being a faculty trainer as the instructional designer and faculty support there are things that you learn that that are helpful when you're working with faculty and things not to assume such as they know how to log into Canvas and so making sure all those resources are there and we focused on nine central topics um, Canvas basics creating and uploading content quizzes grading lecture capture options um, facilitating interaction, had a drop in lab. And then I, I, I also realized this was the great opportunity, despite the fact that I'd really been an OER advocate on campus, I had a captive audience now, so to speak, where I had all these faculty that really needed this information. Here was another opportunity to talk to them about the benefits of using OER and openly licensed content. So I snuck in another training in that rotation of nine about finding alternative content. And I very intentionally didn't put in there using OER in your course because it titling it finding alternative content fit the context that faculty needed they needed alternative content that wasn't just locked behind the library and it was so amazing to see how many new faculty who had previously despite hearing the presentation after presentation on oer when i framed it differently to that this is openly licensed content that you can put into your course right now today getting ready to, to teach tomorrow to the students, it was like light bulbs went off. So it was a good learning opportunity for me about sometimes using different words to bring faculty in is important as well. And so we, that was one of the first ways that we did. So we got through that first week. Um, we did massive hundreds of trainings to faculty. It was super exciting. So then we, we went online. So then the next weekend I had to take a look at our online certification for faculty. Knew this was something that, all right, now I've got them um, 
basic information they need to, to just go because it is what it is, but we need to work on getting faculty certified and really robustly understand what it means to teach online. Um, so I spent the next weekend going through our online certification um, with a fine tooth comb and understanding that faculty might not have the same basis and platforms of information regarding the LMS and regarding those things that we like them to come into the certification and making sure that we had put those just in time teaching tips in there and helping to re remind them, all right, for as, as disoriented as you feel going through this, here's a great way to apply it to your teaching um with with your with your students um, and also here became another opportunity with captive audience to really talk to them about using openly licensed content and other resources available to them so previous to this in my online teaching certification i had you know pieces about oer and just kind of wetting their whistle getting them excited about it and i realized this was the opportunity to really dive deep into finding content for their course because this is what they desperately needed. And so I, I revised the certification to include an entire module going um, through a little bit more in depth about what OER is, um, why we use it, what the benefit is for you as faculty, but also for your students, you know, talking through that this allows them that if they were going to the library and photocopying the book, you've just cut out that resource to the students, but you have all of these resources that are openly licensed and authors are saying, yes, use this information and how you could put it in their course. And again, I was so encouraged at the end of our first cohort that finished the spring semester and then another cohort that we went through in the summer, how many instructors just said yes to OER because it was framed in a way that made sense right then. And it wasn't just about cost at that moment. It was about, hey, you as faculty, this is better for you and it's better for your students that are living in this world right now. Um, so yeah, that, that's basically what we did. And then moving forward, now our online certification includes this robust OER element. Um, and it's a great way to talk to faculty about it. And it's helped them to see it's, it's, it's more than just cost savings, but the benefit to students and the benefit to faculty. And as we go forward in our trainings, it, it's helped to explode out what OER is for our faculty. That's amazing, Amanda, thank you. I really hear the uh, the urgency and also how that afforded some new opportunities uh, for OER um, as you rolled out this training. Sort of similar for you, James. Uh, what what are the key changes that you've seen with OER, online teaching and learning? Uh, the supports that you gave, uh, the changes that you tried to bring about, and how is OER integrated? And I guess the second part of that, and we'll bring Amanda back for this too, is are there, are there policies and procedures for making this happen now in the crisis and in the longer term? Sure, thanks, Amy. Yeah, I, Amanda described a, a, lot, a lot of similar, similar approaches that we took at College of the Canyons to what she did at Reedley College. But let, let, me, let me set a little bit of context similar to Amanda's. At College of the Canyons prior to the pandemic, uh, around 25% of all of our classes, all of the classes in our schedule were already online. 50% uh, of all of our faculty teaching uh, were already fully certified, fully qualified to teach online. So we had that base uh, already in place. And with o Open Educational Resources or OER, around 30% of our students, and this is prior to the pandemic, around 30% of our students were already in classes utilizing OER. We have multiple zero textbook cost pathways, so complete programs that students can follow without ever having to purchase commercial textbooks. So, so we already had um, many of those uh, sort of building blocks in place at College of the Canyons, sim similar to what Amanda described for Reedley College. Uh, and and I, I suppose I'll, I, I would describe three, three big trends or three big shifts that I saw. First of all, as Amanda alluded to, uh, there was just massive professional development going on as, as was happening all over the world. All of us who are professionals in, in the digital space or online education or, or uh, um, open educational resources, we were all faced with this massive, massive challenge to help our institutions make the transition, make the great pivot. Uh, and like Amanda, we had an opportunity to 
really have contact with every single faculty member uh, during a very short period of time. At, at College of the Canyons, we already, uh, as, uh, as Amanda mentioned at Reedley, we already had open educational resources sprinkled throughout some of our training for faculty to become uh, online educators. That was already woven into uh, sort of the standard training at College of the Canyons. Uh, and during, during the Great Pivot, we did not add additional training specifically on open educational resources. We did not go in uh, to our faculty and say, now's the time to switch to open educational resources. And we didn't do that for a couple of reasons. First of all, as I mentioned, we were already at a pretty good starting point, pretty high level of awareness. And secondly, uh, there was already OER woven into uh, woven into our training. So we are, we're, are pretty confident that as people make their way through our training, they're being exposed to OER. But in addition, there are two other trends that I want to point out that to, to go back to the question, two other trends in this shift that I observe. Uh, and I'm, I'm guessing that, that many of our audience would also have observed them. Um, first of all, uh, there's a heightened awareness. There, the pandemic brought a heightened awareness uh, of the digital divide, the gross inequities, the lack of resources that too many of our students face. Uh, that we can say, oh, if students don't have a computer, they can come to our campus to use our computers. Well, guess what? They can't now. Or if they can't afford uh, a Wi-Fi plan, they can come to our campus. But guess what? They can't do that now. So there, there were, all, there, again, through, through many different surveys that we've seen all over the world, hopefully your institution has done a survey of your students so you know what the situation is in your community. Um, we see this happen. We see an awareness all over the world. Um, so there is a sharpened, I think, uh, sensitivity or is a sharpened sensitivity on the part of our institutions of educators uh, about what our students don't have. And, and goodness knows a lot of us were finding out what we don't have at home as we made the transition to working from home. A lot of us found out, gosh, our our home Wi-Fi connection is not quite as stable as we thought it would be. Uh, we drop off of meetings all the time or my video is shaky, my audio is shaky. So imagine what our students are going through. So there, there's that, that a greater awareness of inequity, disparity uh, on the part of our students. And that I think, I hope, leads our colleagues, our faculty colleagues to be more open-minded about alternative solutions, to be more open-minded about reaching students where they are and not forcing students to go through the purchases that commercial materials require. Uh, and then secondly, um, we also see that there, there was quite a need for faculty to engage in, let's say, a lot more do-it-yourself approaches to instructional materials. Prior to the pandemic, in a traditional on-campus setting, a lot of faculty could rely on our academic libraries providing resources to students whether it's uh, textbooks or other resources, or they could rely on students going to laboratories um, to access uh, lab science material, or they could rely on students accessing computers on campus, institutional computers to access uh, software that an institution had a license for. But now with everybody off campus, gee, what do you do? You, you and your students might not have access to all of those resources that are physically on campus. So, a lot of people were left in this situation with having to put things together on their own. And that opens up, again, the imagination uh, of saying, I don't need to rely on what I'm receiving from the commercial publishers. Uh, and I might be willing or you know, more, more willing to put together resource materials myself. And then, of course, in the United States, and I know I, I'm very happy to see we have a lot of, a lot of uh, colleagues from around the world with us today. But in the United States, we also face this uh, really uh, shameful situation in which many commercial textbook publishers simply refuse to do business with academic libraries. Um, I, can, I can call up a, a commercial textbook publisher right now and say, hey, would you please sell me uh, an electronic version of your textbook so I can make it available to my, to, to, to my students? And I can say, here's the cash, here's the money right now. And they simply won't do business with us. So uh, that shameful act. That shameful behavior on the part of some commercial textbook publishers 
is another factor forcing faculty to do things for themselves. So adding those three, three trends together, I think really uh, leads more people to be willing and able and even needing to embrace open educational resources. So that's a long-winded answer uh, before we even touch on the policies and procedures. I wanna pause and, and Amy, see if you want me to continue. No, that's great, James. Um, and maybe if Amanda wants to pop in um, as we talk about these procedures, tell us a little bit more, James, on uh, you know your your leadership um, at at College of the Canyons and uh, what you've seen where OER champions can make a difference. And uh, we've talked a little bit about this that you can't mandate that faculty change their practice and change their course materials, but there are other ways to support them to do so. Yeah, thanks, Amy. So, and a little more context for, for folks uh, who, are, who are attending today. Uh, in, in, the California community, in the California Community Colleges, we pride ourselves on shared governance or uh, uh, collaborative decision-making. So uh, administration, staff, and faculty are all trying to move together in the same direction. Uh, so it's, it's unproductive, in, in my experience in the California Community Colleges, it's unproductive for uh, administration to uh, try to change culture through a policy. Uh, it, 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 it's awfully tempting sometimes to say, gosh, I want a policy that I can just take and put into my institution. But, but in our context, that, that doesn't work unless you're bringing everyone else with you. So. Uh, in many institutions, as, as an administrator or a, or a leader, uh, you can help to shape, change culture or shift culture over time uh, through exercising what I call soft power, you know, influence, that is being sure that you speak up uh, at all those wonderful meetings that administrators get to attend. Uh, be sure to speak up uh, and identify OER as a solution or as a tool to the different problems that are being presented, the problem of, of student equity or the, the uh, horrible uh, uh, achievement gap, the performance gap that we see between different, different populations in the United States, um, the uh, cost barrier that our students uh, experience in the United States, um, the challenge of implementing uh, guided pathways so that students can coherently make their way through an institution from start to finish and, and understand what they're doing. Uh, you, you can present uh, OER as a solution to those challenges or as a tool to help achieve those overall institutional goals. Even uh, the challenge of enrollments uh, in the United States, we read about declining enrollments all over uh, higher education, particularly in the community colleges. And we see that here in, in California as well. Uh, double digit declines in enrollment. It's horrifying for our finances, of course. Uh, well one tool to address that challenge is utilizing, better utilizing and better marketing, if you will, uh, the use of open educational resources to let our students know that, hey, if you are experiencing economic hardship during these times, you can attend our institution and you will not be burdened with textbook costs. So there's that soft power, but I'll, let, me, let me pause and, and, and turn it over to Amanda because uh, I, I know she, she has lots of, lots of good stuff to add as well. Um, and, and James hit the, the nail on the head, coming at it at the time from a faculty perspective, it, it was the support that the administrators on our campus were willing to give in, in numerous contexts. So when it came to developing the trainings and for the online certification, it was this trust that they had in the instructional designers, the DE team and, and the, the faculty um, to, to really do what needed to be done for faculty. And that involved talking about openly licensed content and talking about finding alternative co content for their courses. And, and it wasn't um, a lot of intercession to, no, no, you, you should be doing this. We need you to train on that. But just this trust that we were going to do what needed to be done um, in talking about um, OER and supporting the faculty. And that's been what's been pervasive at, at our campus in our annual report this year, um, our OER growth and our zero textbook cost courses growth was highlighted um, a full page 
in our president's annual report. And that really gives a clear message to faculty that it's your choice. 100%, you get to choose the content that you want. We're not gonna say either way um, what you have to do, but as administrators on the campus, we will support you 100% making the shift to using openly licensed content. And that's been a very important message that um, our, our faculty have heard and, and have um, been embraced by administrator support. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you pointed that out, Amanda. The, the, the ability that leadership has to highlight certain priorities for the institution. Uh, as uh, if you're not involved in leadership, uh, well, let, let me speak for myself. When I was, before I was involved in leadership my, at my institution and I was a, a junior faculty member uh, and I, I heard uh, somebody in senior leadership speak about an issue I thought, oh my gosh, that that's settled. That's the the policy. That's the the directive that we all have to go simply because it appeared in somebody's speech or it was the full page in the annual report. Now, years later, I understand that's not necessarily the case that it's some grand policy announcement, but rather it's the willingness and awareness of an individual in the office to say, hey, let's put that text there. Let's add that and let's highlight that so that we're sending a message. It's not a directive. We're not forcing anybody, but it's that soft power again. So for those of you who are in the audience who are not in that leadership position, I think it's very helpful to to get the ear of those leaders who have the ability to highlight an issue or highlight open educational resources or highlight professional development for instructors um, through their different through their different levers of soft power. And another area that I would mention that's probably per particular to administrators is access to resources. In other words, money. Right there's there's always money, you know, dirty secret. There's always money, no matter no matter uh, what kind of economic crisis we're we're reading about in the newspapers. Um, there's always money. Uh, administrators have access and to the information about where the money comes from. Uh, in the United States today, we see uh, from the federal government and then at the state government level as well, uh, various waves of stimulus funding or COVID-19 relief funding coming out uh, to our institutions. It's coming out in various forms. Uh, it's coming out under various names. It's coming out with various um, qualifications for spending. Um, and the administrators at your institution are the ones who receive the memos from the federal government and the memos from the state government describing what, how much money there is, how that money can be used, what the eligibility uh, requirements are for using that money. So again, you get back into a situation in which individual administrators who uh, have access to that information can choose to interpret that information as permitting or allowing the support of faculty professional development around the digital transition, around online education, and around open educational resources. Uh, the, the fun, some of the funding that I'm thinking of, that I'm aware of in, in my world and in, in Amanda's world as well in, in the California Community Colleges, specifically calls out uh, activities that support faculty in making the transition to digital and remote learning. And then it also, it also specifically calls out uh, economic relief for students. Well, both of those clearly can be interpreted to support online education and open educational resources. Great, thanks James and Amanda, you've really made these connections between uh, what influence you can have as leaders um, on your campus and uh, the mindset that, that really needs to accompany the, the changes that faculty are able to make themselves um, when they adopt and, and implement OER. Um, when we think about the implementation, um, California's had quite a bit of success and forward movement with OER um, over time. Where, have you, where are you seeing um, ways that this has been successful? Are there ways to measure it? I know sometimes it's hard to have that kind of data. But just in terms of open educational practice, 
when faculty do this um, adoption, when uh, local academic senates um, are motivated and support each other to do that and collaborate, uh, where collaboration is really a factor, where are you seeing um, successful uh, work happening? Amanda, there's you know? <laughs> there's lots of different questions um, in uh, in there and ways to um, address. I, I one of the the opportunities that this transition has also provided, and and I highlighted this a lot when I was talking earlier, but just allowing faculty the opportunity to to reconceptualize how they think about instructional um, content um, and then supporting faculty um, through that. Um, one of the anecdotes that that really made this clear to me as I was doing training and beyond is we have a large natural resource program on our campus with a lot of classroom resources. And so um, when you have a program that's very hands-on such as that and it switch shifts to online um, in the initial days, there were no other options. Um, I, I happened to be friends with one of the instructors on, on social media, and he was posting these amazing wildlife pictures um, that he had taken just as, as a hobby um, and in his previous career. And so I reached out to him and said, hey, these are, these are amazing. These are things that would be so beneficial to the open community right now who might not have access to these images in their textbooks or in their backyard like we do in the Central Valley. What would you consider putting these in an open licensed um, media repository so other instructors have access to it? And, and the instructor, even though I had talked to him extensively about openly licensed content, um, he had never put two and two together that he didn't need to write a book to contribute to the open content, but he could take all of these vast experiences he had had in his life and share it with other instructors who were desperately seeking resources from other parts of the world, other parts of the United States that might not have it based on where they were. And so we had a lot of different conversations in different contexts as instructors were creating these instructional videos um, because we had had the opportunity to purchase um, Camtasia and, and TechSmith Nomia for our faculty so that they could do some more robust editing. And so in the context of those trainings saying, hey, when you create these videos, share it out to your faculty colleagues. And we talked about different platforms that they could do that. Um, and so the admin support of being able to purchase something like that in, in this time, um, and then increasing our conversations with faculty about how they could continue to give back as they were creating content for their courses to share it out with colleagues so that we could get this growth of uh, and pool of, of openly licensed resources for faculties that were in the same boat as them and struggling to make this transition away from the physical resources they had used. Yeah, I, th I think that's a really, really excellent point, Amanda, about your, your friend with the photos. You know, there, as I mentioned before, there, there are a lot of faculty who are having uh, to do it yourself these days, uh, putting together a lot of resources, uh, collecting different resources. Hopefully, if they've gone through our training uh, or the training that you're offering at your institutions, they understand uh, what the difference is between a free resource and an openly licensed resource. And this presents an opportunity for uh, engaging more people in the conversation around open education uh, and to help them uh, take what they're discovering, what they're building, what they're curating, and uh, contribute that under an open, open license uh, to, to the larger, larger world of educators. Uh, but I want to really address the, the second part of the question there, uh, or the second bullet up there. Uh, how, how could open education play a role in terms of equity, social justice, and, and, and cultural responsiveness? Uh, I think that's wonderfully uh, a, a development that we see emerging, a conversation that we see emerging in open education in the United States. Uh, certainly our friends in Canada are, are a bit ahead of us in this awareness. Um, but in, in the United States, there's, there's over the past year, a greater uh, understanding or awareness that the open education field is blindingly white and uh, uh, that uh, we need to, the collective we who care about open education and, and digital and online, online learning, uh, we need to be very active in uh, expanding uh, the field, uh, making the field more welcoming, uh, both as a, as a field, but also in terms of the materials that we uh, support. Uh, you know, if we have a, uh, 
a commercial textbook that reproduces the structures of white supremacy and patriarchy. And then we replace that with a free textbook that reproduces the structures of white supremacy and patriarchy. Well, you know, that's really not what we want to accomplish. That's not really going to change, change the society the, the way I want to change the society, at least. So uh, in open education, generally, I, I see good indications that people are taking those challenges more seriously and more willing to be uh, creative and imaginative in moving away from the structures of commercial publishing, uh, not just in terms of the licensing of the materials, but also in terms of how the materials help to reflect the reality of our students and, and the world we really live in today. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm going to tack on to that because there's a question in the, the chat, um, and I think it relates really well to this, at least from my perception. The question in the chat is, is basically how do we get instructors to um, get over feeling they own their stuff and and to share it? Um, but I don't. I, I don't force. And for, from me, my perspective, if an instructor doesn't want to share their content, absolutely 100%. They have the right to own it. They have the right to make money off of it. But what I do do to address those is just what James was talking about. Not just talk about the the cost effectiveness, um, because that doesn't necessarily apply to the hearts of all instructors. I, I, you know, I wished it did, but other instructors by approaching it from um, a different, from a social justice lens, from an equity lens, that these are the things that you can do by openly licensing your content. This is what it enables to build. It's another way to have that conversation. And for instructors that are flat out, no, I'm not gonna do this, then, then that is their priority. There are so many others that want to have that conversation. And so I shift my attention and, and shift my focus on those that, that say, yeah, this is something I want to openly license content because it does something that I need to respond to the, the, the unique culture that my students for us in the Central Valley are a part of. And I need to talk about their struggles as being migrant farm workers. And I want to create content that uniquely addresses that. And so for some instructors, that's what's important to them. Um, and that's the conversation I can have about that's what you can do by openly licensing your content and allowing them to access it free. Well, and that goes back, Amanda, to, to a really important point about the data that we have access to as educators. We sh I hope we know uh, who our students are. Do, do, our, do our institutions regularly survey our students and ask, what barriers are you facing? What is the impact of commercial textbook costs? Um, do you have access to technology at home? Do you have access to Wi-Fi at home? Uh, how many hours a week do you work? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if, if your institutions don't do those surveys, then create a survey yourself, just like Amanda did. I know you did at Reedley College. You've done, you've done surveys on your own now for years and it's incredibly powerful data. And, 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 uh, and I, I use, I use the, the information that you collect as well. Uh, but I hope everyone out there uh, can access that information from your institution. And that's another way in which administrators can, can help uh, to move uh, towards online education help move towards open educational resources then that is to ensure that the institution is surveying students and understands the needs of students you just made a great link there james for um the change in mindset around open education and seeing it as a social justice issue involves student voice hearing from students and student participation. Are, are you seeing um, any supports or are there ones that you wish uh, you'd like to implement in say the coming year that could lift, uh, lift student voice and engagement around the, the creation of new materials and being more inclusive and diverse? Well, uh, th thanks, Amy. I'll very happily speak about the model that we have at College of the Canyons, and that is uh, we, in, we employ uh, current students and recent graduates to help support faculty who want to 
uh, adopt, adapt, and author open educational resources. So we have a collection of young people who are getting jobs, learning skills in editing and searching and, and licensing and accessibility. Uh, and then they're supporting the faculty in, in doing the work that the faculty might want to do. You know, maybe they, they do buy into the social justice and the cost argument, but it's difficult for them to find the time or to actually do the, do the labor of, of uh, combining file formats and searching for content. So we, we employ students to do that. And it's, it's a wonderful opportunity for the students. But in addition, uh, on campus in, in making the case to faculty, the students are much more credible than I am. Uh, and in fact, with the support of, of our friends at, at Michaels and 20MM Foundation, we were able to uh, engage a, a number of students from uh, California State Universities and California Community Colleges to create a, an OER student advocacy toolkit that lives on OER Commons, which is supported by ISKME, of course. So uh, maybe maybe Ryan could throw a throw a link to that in the chat. Uh, there's a great opportunity for students at all of our institutions to become involved and to uh, be our partners in advocating for more faculty to use open educational resources. Yeah, and I do want to highlight that importance of the student voice because in these couple of years that I've been talking about OER on my campus, um, in every context that student voice and the data that I've been able to present to faculty um, has been powerful. One of the questions that we asked um, in a survey we did three years ago, but also I did one in the fall semester as part of a sabbatical project, we asked them directly, has the cost of textbooks, so we, we took out any of their variables and asked, has the cost of textbooks stopped you from completing your degree and and I don't know about your campuses but degree completion and, and finishing a degree and finishing a certificate is a central focus on our campus and so we took it to the students is textbooks preventing you from finishing your degree over 60 percent are saying yes it is I cannot take a full load of classes 12 plus units because of the cost of the textbooks. I cannot take this class because it's a $200 textbooks, the end, and it's not worth failing for me because if I fail, I lose my financial aid. And well, that's been a, go ahead, James. Oh, no, no, go ahead, Amanda, I'm sorry. And, and that's been such an important piece of conversation. And I think I'm gonna steal James's thunder, especially when talking to administrators and, and getting um, just to say that this is an important and worthwhile thing to, to fund and to give faculty time to, we're not quite there yet, but, but we're getting there, um, because it directly relates to them being able to complete their degree, taking more units and providing that data from the student voice. We also, in each of those surveys, just gave them a context to tell us more, tell us what they're feeling, tell us what kind of burden it is. Um, 700 plus quotes in both of the surveys of students ranging from just pure anger at what they're experiencing for textbook cost. I mean, just, just mad. Um, to just a, a plea of please, I, I, I'm taking this survey, obviously it means something, do something so I can finish my degree. And that just giving the quotes has been so powerful for faculty to really sit back and say, oh my goodness, this is what I'm doing to my, to my students. Um, and it really becomes very personal when they can relate it to, to a student at their college or within their district. Yeah, exactly, Amanda. And even, even if, even if, even if you think your leadership, your institutional leadership is not moved by the, the voices of students, and I, I, mean, I assure you they are, but even if you, you know, buy into the, the, the evil stereotype of administrators, what Amanda's data points to is the necessity to eliminate that barrier for students in order for the business of the institution to pro proceed. So if you think that your administrators only care about the business of the institution, OER is still a good bet and a good argument for the business of the institution to attract enrollments and keep students going. That's awesome. Thank you, both of you. Uh, we want to highlight that there's a companion guide to the admin guide that Cynthia walked through. And uh, the resource that James and Amanda are talking about um, for students uh, and, the, and the data that we're hearing from students uh, and continue to integrate that into um, our work with OER going forward is, is really critical. We'll be sharing these links. Uh, and I wanna ask Ryan if there's been any Q&A or other um, chat comments that we should address. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I know we have about five or so minutes. So um, one question that came in from Nancy Messina and Amanda, I think this was directed to you when you were talking about some of the work that you were doing with faculty. Um, but she was hoping that you could share a little bit more around, you know, what the OER training looked like. And specifically, was there a hub or a resource that faculty could refer back to after the training? Yes. So, um, I refined it to what it is now. So I, I'll, I'll share the link or email me. I think I'm running out of time to get all the links. So I want to be very clear that, that it's better than what it was at the time. But we had just created a self-paced introduction to OER course in Canvas that, you know, faculty could go through and just get the basics if they wanted to dive more deep than what was in the online certification. Um, I know I, I mentioned multiple pieces. So the, the small one hour training that was finding content for your courses briefly talked about what the difference is between openly licensed content and free resources. I think like James had talked about earlier, that's a really important distinction. Um, I wanna make sure faculty understood um, the online certification had the entire module was a much deeper dive into the differences between the two, provided some resources um, similar to what is found in both of the guides that are shared here, fabulous resources um, of where they can find it and then how they could put that in their, their content. And then all of that went into much more detail in the self-paced um, Canvas course of um, it's Open Education 101. Um, and then we went, there's another one, Open Pedagogy 101 that that talks about it on what do you want to do to the next level of engaging your students. So I know that wasn't information, um, but I'm happy to share um, all of those links. If you send me an email, I think I'm running out of time to, to get them and pop them in the chat. And, and maybe Amy, if we could advance to the next slide, I know we have all of our contact information there. I'll continue to ask some of these questions, but um, if people do wanna reach out um, for uh, specifics, the, the next question in the Q&A, um, and I apologize if I am mispronouncing this name, is from uh, Ju Juwama Asaf. Uh, so the widespread of OER poses questions about the accuracy of resources in cases where the provider was not mentioned or the author was not well known. Is there an additional feature that could be developed later for OER that facilitate our evaluation of these resources? And maybe James and Amanda, you can just talk about sort of instances at your institutions when you're working with faculty around this issue. Oh yeah, I'm very happy to address that question. I, I appreciate the, the sincerity of the question, um, but I, I think the response to the question around evaluating or assessing OER is that the faculty member should be reading the material and vetting the material and assessing the material him or herself. We hire faculty members presumably because they know stuff, right? Uh, they've got advanced degrees. We trust them, we hire them, and we trust them to walk into a classroom and open their mouths and speak, right? We trust them to write exams uh, and to assess students. We should also trust them to uh, assess to evaluate the written materials. Uh, so the, the simple answer is that faculty members should utilize their disciplinary expertise and read the materials that they want to use. Yep, and I'll chime in and echo that. It's when faculty come at me, um, I say that lovingly and endearingly, with that question, I ask, well, I know you are a great instructor and just because something has Pearson on the spine, I know that you didn't just adopt it and slap it in your class, but you read it to make sure it was the quality you want for your students. This is no different than the OER that I'm handing you. Look at it, but here's what the difference is. If you find a paragraph that you say, that is junk, I don't like that, you get to change it because it's openly licensed. And that was a key difference when we're looking at how do I get faculty to understand, you know, to, to evaluate it is if you don't like it, change it and the author has said yes please do please do and then share it out great and i unfortunately we only have a minute left and i know there are a few more questions so as i mentioned i think everyone on this panel has graciously offered um to answer additional questions via email so um please 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 reach out um if your question wasn't answered during this conversation but uh, I'd really like to take the time to, to thank our partners at ISKME for co-hosting um, this webinar with us. Um, and of course, 
both Amanda and James for taking the time to speak about the experiences at their colleges. Um, as a reminder, please uh, utilize these resources, both the faculty uh, guide as well as the admin guide, and there are links that have been provided in the chat to both resources. Uh, and then from the Michelson 20 Million Minds Foundation, um, a, a just kind of announcement that we will be having another round of our Spark Grant program focused on our digital equity initiative. Uh, launching in early March. Um, so please feel free to go to our website and sign up for updates if you are uh, interested. Uh, we're also hoping to have an OER centric funding cycle uh, in early summer. So again, if you go to 20mm.org, um, you'll be able to sign up for updates around that. But thank you everyone for your time and I hope you all have a great day. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks everyone for coming.